I'll just, uh, I'll just introduce our speakers. They're sitting roughly in speaking order. So first we have Ilya Samin, who is a professor of law at George Mason University. His particular expertise in property law, including eminent domain and constitutional issues. Um, he also writes in an eminently readable fashion for um, a blog called The Bullock Conspiracy, which I highly recommend you all read. Um, our second speaker is known to hopefully all of you. Sorry, I'm, I'm short, so I just kind of figured that you could all see over the top of me, but perhaps not. Um, Austin Erickson is a PhD student um, here at the University of, here in Sydney. Um, he's doing a PhD in applied mathematics. He's previously got a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in like several majors, all relating to science and maths. So he is a bona fide nerd, um, as opposed to just a geek. And um, the, the other thing is that he is a director of operations for the Australian Taxpayers Alliance. Um, our third speaker, obviously last but certainly not least, uh, is Trevor Burris, who you, whom you all would have heard from at, on Saturday morning. Feels like a long time ago. Um, he is a research fellow at the Cato Institute in Washington. Uh, alongside his research work, which is excellent and very, very and quite varied, um, he is the host of a libertarian podcast called Free Thoughts. And one of was it Free Thoughts podcast that did the Star Wars? Yeah, we feel yeah. yeah. So the other thing is that Trevor Ilya are like two thirds of a of an amazing um, trio of an excellent Star Wars podcast. Um, part of the Free Thoughts series that was released just before um, the newest movie came out, so discusses some of those um, you know, libertari like po politics of Star Wars, so I highly recommend all of it. Um, so although these two are legal legals and um, Austin's a, like Austin is a science nerd, I think we can all say, like, let's, get it, let's get ready to get our geek on. Great. So I'm tempted to go into a discussion of the distinction between nerds and geeks that was raised earlier. However, I will instead stick to my assigned topic of the relationship between libertarianism and science fiction. So the first thing that might be asked is, why should we even care about the politics of science fiction in the first place, whether it's libertarian or not? After all, think about who is the stereotypical science fiction nerd. Uh, well, the stereotype suggests it's a person who's 30 years old or older even, but they're still living at home in their parents' basement. They have no life. They can't get any dates. So on Friday night, they, old, they watch old Star Trek episodes on their DVD player or something. And I'm not going to say that this stereotype is completely wrong. However, it's pretty obvious if you've been following popular culture the last several decades that science fiction and fantasy reaches far more widely than that. Uh, the, the survey data suggests that more than a quarter of Americans read science fiction or fantasy novels. Even more people than that watch science fiction or fantasy movies, TV shows. If you just think of some of the biggest sensations of popular culture the last 15 or 20 years, The War of the Rings, Harry Potter, The Hunger Games, many others, Game of Thrones now, uh, they all fall into this genre. So therefore, this is a genre that many people follow, read, and watch. And it has at least some impact on people's perceptions of the world, including the world of politics. And that also is an additional reason why we should care about this. Even if, unlike me, you're not a science fiction nerd yourself, or even a science fiction geek, and maybe you don't care about the subject for its own sake, you may still care about it because of the impact that it has on our perceptions of the world. World. Certainly many more people read and watch uh, things in the science fiction genre than ever read any kind of serious nonfiction books about politics, economics, even perhaps more than read books by Mises or Hayek and the like. So I'm going to talk in my presentation about how science fiction, at least relative to other genres, tends to be have a disproportionate libertarian presence. I'm going to talk a little bit about why that is. And finally, at the end, I'll discuss a little about how this has some implications for our efforts to promote liberty. So first things first, if you just look at some of the major science fiction or fantasy works in recent decades, there's a pretty significant libertarian influence in many of them. Take, for example, 
example, The Lord of the Rings, probably the most successful uh, fantasy franchise of the last 50 or 60 years in terms of both the books and also the recent, uh, the more recent movies. Uh, there's clearly significant libertarian themes there. The whole point is that the ring of power must be destroyed as opposed to, for example, transferred to good people who will use it for good ends. Even the good and admirable characters in the War of the Rings, like Gandalf, for example, they say, don't give me the ring. Why? Because I can't be trusted with it. I'm going to be corrupted if I have it for very long. This, of course, is a metaphor for political power and how people cannot be trusted with that. Tolkien, I think, deliberately intended it this way. Uh, if you look into those parts of the War of the Rings, relatively few, of course, but there are there where he portrays governments in a relatively positive way, particularly the government of the Shire, where the hobbits live. It turns out to be a very minimal night watchman libertarian type of government, indeed almost literally so. It's hard to see any examples of government in the Shire other than the night watchman sort of a function. And of course, this is in accord with Tolkien's own generally negative views of government. He once said that my political opinions lean more and more to anarchy, understood meaning abolition of control, not whiskered men with bombs. Uh, he also said that the most improper job of any man, even saints, is bossing around other men. Not one in a million is fit for it, and least of all, those who seek out the opportunity. So although I don't think Tolkien was a down-the-line libertarian by any means, he did certainly have a lot of the libertarian skepticism of government. You also see some of this uh, in the other big fantasy sensation of the last uh, decade or two, the Harry Potter series, where obviously the main villain that Harry Potter and his friends are fighting is Lord Voldemort and his Death Eaters, but only slightly less villainous is the Ministry of Magic, the wizard government of the uh, wizard world. Uh, and as legal scholar Ben Barton has pointed out, it seems as if that Ministry of Magic is an all bureaucracy government. Uh, it's entirely made up of bureaucrats who are accountable to virtually no one. Uh, there's very little control over them from democracy, freedom of the press, separation of powers, or any of these things that we might think constrain government in any meaningful way. And as a result, the ministry is constantly oppressive, inefficient. Uh, it does very little or nothing to prevent the rise of Lord Voldemort. On the other hand, it does oppress innocent people in many different ways. And it's significant that it seems like its problems are structural and not just a result of the wrong people being in power. When late in the series, the ineffectual minister of magic, Cornelius Fudge, is forced to resign and replaced by a much more aggressive minister. You think at first things are going to change. Finally, the ministry is going to be run better. But in reality, it's just as bad as before or even worse. So like Tolkien, I don't think J.K. Rowling, the author of this series, was or is a libertarian. Uh, she is generally fairly left wing, but there are at least some important libertarian themes in the series. Uh, and finally, even more recently, we have had the Hunger Games series and the movies based on it starring Jennifer Lawrence. I don't know if you've seen them, but if you haven't, you should. They're, they're quite good. And here also, if you look at what the political situation in the series is, there's a lot of libertarian themes. Uh, what you have is this tyrannical central government, the capital oppressing the districts, including the one where Katniss Everdeen, the main character, comes from. Uh, and the government oppresses them in many of the same ways that libertarians like to point to as flaws of real world government. Even more interestingly, it turns out that when an alternative government is formed to contest the capital's control, a government operated out of District 13, it turns out that that government, led by President Al McCoyne, is just as oppressive or even worse than the capital government led by President Snow. Uh, obviously, President Coyne is called Coyne as a somewhat unsubtle sign that she's just the other side of the same coin as the government that she's fighting against. So if the capital seems like in some ways a right-wing fascist government, then District 13 is very much, very clearly, a sort of left-wing totalitarian socialist government does the other side of the same coin. And so here, too, you have, I think, significant libertarian themes. Now, I could go like this with many other works, 
literally dozens of them, but there's many other examples of libertarian science fiction and fantasy. I certainly don't contend that all or even most science fiction and fantasy literature is libertarian. There's a great deal of left-wing science fiction and a great deal also just doesn't have much of a political message of any kind. But it is certainly the case that libertarian ideas are disproportionately present in this genre. So we might ask why. Well, one obvious reason is that because works in this genre tend to be set in worlds very different from our own, that's almost the point of the genre, uh, therefore they tend to go against tradition, uh, and therefore this is similar to the libertarian mindset. After all, most of us in this room, we are constantly advocating things that are very different from the status quo, in some cases things that have never been fully realized in the world at all. So there's an affinity there between libertarian skeptics of tradition and what you see in the genre. Moreover, much science fiction and fantasy literature uses dystopian scenarios where things are really bad, and a very obvious dystopian scenario to use is one with an oppressive and tyrannical government where you need some kind of private initiative to oppose it. If the ordinary government bureaucracy could just solve the problem, you wouldn't get much of a science fiction story out of it in most cases, so it makes sense instead to have the government be oppressive and that leads to a better story. Finally, it's also worth noting that uh, the science fictional genre, generally speaking, tends to be technologically optimistic. Uh, most science fiction writers assume that overall the development of technology is a good thing. Uh, and of course, most libertarians tend to be in that same boat relative to conservatives and left-wingers uh, were more likely to be technologically optimistic, so there is an affinity there. Finally, there's the point about the type of person who writes science fiction and also the type of person who tends to become a libertarian. Uh, if you look at the libertarian personality, which has actually been studied by Jonathan Haidt, a well-known political psychologist, on average, I'm saying on average, not true of everybody, but on average, relative to adherence of other ideologies, Libertarians tend to be less empathetic. It's harder for us to sympathize and empathize with other people, but more logical and rationalistic. We care more about, on average, about logical reasoning. Uh, and this, of course, is also true of science fiction fans compared to fans of other genres. In most other literary genres, the main thing is that there's a character that you can identify with and you feel empathy with him or her, uh, and that's how the author captures the readers. With many science fiction and fantasy works, the real hero of the story is not a particular person, but rather the imaginary world that has been presented to you. And so people in, who follow the genre, they're really interested in figuring out, well, what is the true politics of Westeros? Or how did the Republic in Star Wars really work? Who really ran the Jedi Order and so forth? Uh, and this is the kind of thing that also interest the sort of people who become uh, libertarians. So finally, what are the implications of this for promoting liberty? Well, in one sense, the fact that libertarianism has this presence in science fiction is very useful. I mentioned earlier many millions of people read or watch science fiction works, and also science fiction for many people is the dominant way that we get an image of the future and what it might be like. So it's a good thing that libertarianism has been successful there. On the other hand, it's also a relatively limited kind of success because although the audience for science fiction is large, it is not fully representative of all areas of society. To just take one obvious example, it's overwhelmingly male. Uh, about two thirds or more of the people who watch or read a lot of science fiction tend to be male. So if we want to reach more women, and it's certainly something we need to do, uh, to promote liberty, then we would want to see if libertarians can achieve greater success in other genres, perhaps building on what has happened uh, with science fiction. Just to give a few examples, the one genre that even more people read than science fiction, at least in the US, is mystery and thriller novels. Uh, and there's obvious opportunities to have libertarian theme works there, but that opportunity for the most part has not been effectively used. Similarly, uh, crime novels have a large readership. Also, romance novels, they're, they're obviously the, the demographic profile is almost the opposite of science fiction, disproportionately female. In each of these genres, there are opportunities to have libertarian themed work, uh, but very few libertarians have actually taken advantage of that. So I think it's great that libertarianism has had success in this one genre, but if you want to build the movement further, appeal to a wider range of people, 
but then uh, if you're the kind of person who writes fiction or produces movies, you should ask yourself, maybe I would want to do this in a genre other than science fiction, one where I can reach a different audience that might not otherwise get the ideas. Uh, so on that note, I conclude, but I really look forward to discussion, both the nerd and geek aspects of it that might arise. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so just to start off with a spoiler warning, there may very well be spoilers in this talk. I, 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 I didn't deliberately include spoilers, uh, but if they slip out, it's not my fault. So if you are worried about basically anything fantasy related, then leave now and, and, and come back in 15 minutes. All right, so um, fortunately, even though I do have two of the three same examples as, as our first speaker, I did prepare a multiverse of talk topics because I was so excited to be speaking on this. I kept starting talks um, and, and didn't get very fast, far past the first few slides, so I've included some of my favorite um, alternative talk topics before we start. Uh, the first is called Looters, Moochers, and Producers, where I designed an objectivist alignment system for Dungeons and Dragons. Um, so uh, I, I'd love to give a presentation on that. Um, <laughs> I'm doing a blog post, so watch, watch for that. Um, the second one is Harry Potter and the Arbitrage Opportunity, uh, because wizards don't understand economics. Um, and <laughs> uh, so this is, I, I found out someone had actually done this after I had the idea. If you, if you, there's a great fan fiction called Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality, uh, which you should all read, where the, the author actually does mention this. But 17 sickles is one galleon. They're both pure gold, pure silver coins, about one ounce. Um, so first of all, the exchange rate's totally wrong. Um, 17 to 1 and uh, silver to gold is actually 90 to 1 in, in our world, so you could easily arbitrage between those. <laughs> Even more so, though, J.K. Rowling actually gave us conversion rates between solid gold galleons and the British pound. So apparently five pounds gets you an ounce of gold. Uh, so, like, it's, <laughs> if, 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 uh, it's really no wonder that uh, Hermione turned up in the Panama Papers. Uh, 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 and uh, the, the, th the third talk I thought would be really, really good to give was just uh, Emperor Palpatine being space drunk because uh, he wanted to make the galaxy great again. Um, but I thought, <laughs> I, I'll save this for after the election. Hopefully this won't be relevant then. All right, so what I decided on, though, uh, was something maybe a little bit more applicable, um, raising Katniss. So what we can learn from science fiction and fantasy for the next generation of libertarians. And... I got really excited when I was researching for this because I found this fantastic editorial that young adult dystopias teach children to submit to the free market, not fight authority. And, <laughs> and this person was decrying the fact that no longer were evil corporations betrayed, or portrayed as the bad guys, but rather the government, which is actually just this benevolent organization that we should all love. Um, and it was found in a very even-handed, neutral publication, um, which I'm sure won't will surprise all of you. But no, I was quite excited to see that this is not my idea, which means that it's probably a good idea, because I didn't come up with it. Uh, but there has definitely been this, this growing sort of theme in young adult fiction that the government is the bad guy. Um, so lesson one here, and I've arranged these by lesson, but they're also arranged by example. Lesson one is solve your own problems. And this does draw from the wizarding world of Harry Potter. Um, and it is, interestingly, an overwhelmingly commerce-based world. You look at the, the, the government, and it is ineffectual, it is bureaucratic, but it also doesn't seem to affect people's daily lives outside of Hogwarts. You look at Diagon Alley, there are no trade restrictions. There are no licensing. You don't need a license to sell wands. You just need to be able to make wands. So it's an overwhelmingly commerce-based society with an ineffectual government that only really causes damage when it starts trying to do stuff, as with most governments. So the Ministry of Magic is consistently betrayed, is incompetent to corrupt, and it completely fails to prevent the return of Voldemort, who takes control of the Ministry for his own end. So that's a quick summary that you've already heard. Um, the lesson from that, though, is that government doesn't solve problems as well as an individual initiative, right? Government makes problems, and it tries to solve problems, but it often creates worse problems than it starts with. So there were some issues at Hogwarts, and uh, the government decided to take out Dumbledore and put in Dolores Umbridge, who is one of the best, worst characters in fiction. Um, if anyone knows her character, she is just wonderfully lovely to hate. Um, Second part of this lesson is don't assume that the good guys will always hold the balance of power. The moment you let someone else solve your problems and you create a power structure that can solve your problems for you, you also create a power structure that can cause problems. So yes, maybe the Ministry of Magic with the right leadership could have solved something, but it was taken over by Lord Voldemort and, and it became a tool against the population. So 
a government strong enough to help you is a government strong enough to control you. And that's another important lesson from this. Uh, and there's a couple of sub-lessons from the same, same genre. And uh, the first one is drop out of school. Um, and that uh, I think uh, a number of characters did this throughout the series. And uh, the second sub-lesson is that once you drop out of school, start a joke store or join a private army. Um, so whether it be the Order of the Phoenix or Dumbledore's army or whether you're Fred and George and you come up with a joke store, this is what you should be doing with your life, not trying to join government and don't bother with your high school. Um, and there are, some really <laughs> there are some really good libertarian quotes from the book, probably not intentional, but my favorite one, which is sort of channeling Tolkien, um, it is a curious thing, but perhaps those who have best, are best suited to power are those who have never sought it. I think that's a good lesson to learn, is that maybe there are good rulers out there, but most of those people don't want to rule because they know that it's not something that good people do. All right, lesson two, be a hero. And again, World of the Hunger Games, we've already had a summer, summary of this, um, right? We've got two children selected to battle each other to the death. It's a lot like youth sports. Um, and we have Candace Everdeen, who is a contestant from the poorest district, who reluctantly starts and lead a rebellion against the capital. And I think it's her reluctance that makes this the most interesting uh, example. Um, because living your life can be an act of rebellion against the state. Katniss doesn't go into this with the, with the goal of, of causing a revolution. In fact, every step of the way, she's just trying to survive and protect those she cares about and live her life. But when you have a state that controls every aspect of your life, simply living that life and protecting those you care about is an act of rebellion. The more that you live and more that you do your own things, you are rebelling against the state that tries to control you. And corollary to that is that doing the right thing is more important than doing the safe thing. There's a few occasions in the second book, Catching Fire, where she tries to sort of settle things down. She tries to walk back the revolution, but her better instincts always come forward and she does the right thing, which throws gasoline on the fire, essentially. Um, which, in retrospect, is probably a metaphor that was captured in the book title. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, these authors, they know stuff. Um, and, and even small actions can have big consequences. So even small acts of rebellion will have big consequences, right? Because you might inspire someone else to do it. You might inspire three people to do it. And this goes back to the talk that I shared this morning where what we do matters. And the fact is we have to do something, even if it is just a small act of rebellion. Even if it's just you, uh, you buy some goods and services with Bitcoin. Or maybe you smoke a joint in public just to show the man that, you know, they can't control you. Um, but these small actions do have big consequences because if enough people do it, you have a real movement on your hands. Um, and from that, I got another quote from President Snow, who's another great villain, uh, especially played uh, in the movies. People viewed your little trick as an act of defiance, not as an act of love. And if a girl can defy the capital and walk away unharmed, what is to prevent them from doing the same? What is to prevent, say, an uprising? That can lead to revolution. And then in a fraction of a time, the whole system collapses. Small actions can have big consequences. Lesson three, do the impossible. Um, so this is probably the most obscure example. It's a, it's a, it's a Japanese anime, Tenga Toppen Gurren Lagann, which I highly recommend you all, you all read. Humanity is being kept oppressed by the Spiral King, um, who's, a, who's a member of a species called the Beastmen who rule over the world. They're a lot like the lizard people who control our real society. Um, and, and he works on behalf of the anti-spirals. And the anti-spirals are this alien race that want to prevent humanity from evolving and progressing out of fear that they will destroy the world. So they're the Greens. Um, and, and Simon and his older brother Kamina, they fight to free humanity and able it to reach its full potential. So it's a very uh, interesting coming of age story over two seasons, all about basically humanity achieving its true potential. All about progress, all against tyranny. Um, and there's two sort of interesting narrative structures that often happen. One of them is more associated with Western fiction. That's you gain great power and then you choose to fight for good. So that's Spider-Man, right? With great power comes great responsibility. He got his powers and then he had to make the choice. Harry Potter got the same thing, right? He was a wizard and then he got to make a choice about what he was going to do with it. But there's another tradition of storytelling um, and that is that great power is gained by fighting for the right cause. Strength comes from the cause you choose to fight for. So within this, um, within this uh, manga, or anime, I think it might be both. Um, the main character's willpower, because he wants to fight for his family and for freedom and for all these things, that is what gives him the strength to overcome his obstacles. So the lesson here is if you're devoting yourself to an ideal, you'll develop yourself as an individual. If you just say, I want to become a good speaker, that's a hard thing to do if you just, I want to be a good speaker because I want to be a good speaker. But if you want to become a good speaker because you want to advance the cause of liberty, you have something to fight for. It gives you that much more energy to develop skills, to make a small difference, and then to drop out of school and start a joke store. So these are all very, very important lessons. So another quote, because I like these quotes. Um, 
The tomorrow that we are trying to reach is not the tomorrow you have set out for us. It is the tomorrow that we choose for ourselves, a tomorrow we choose out of all the infinite universes. And a slightly less serious quote, kick logic out and do the impossible, which is where the title of this last thing does, is that you can achieve things that you don't think you can do if you try. So please take action, go away from here and, and do the impossible, start fighting for liberty. Uh, and so the next slide is, I, I could go on probably for, for hours, and I won't because Trisha's already told me I need to start wrapping up. So some honorable mentions that I did not include but would love to include is Arya Stark from A Song of Fire and Ice or Game of Thrones, for those of you who don't read. Um, <laughs> Jonas from The Giver. Trist from Divergent. Luke and Leia Skywalker from Star Wars. Um, and that's also a nice creepy incest theme, which, hey, free love. <laughs> not my style, but yeah. Uh, and then, of course, and I didn't write it down here, but you have to talk about Firefly if you're going to be talking about science fiction and libertarianism. Um, I think we've all probably seen it. If we haven't, go see it. Um, it's, it's amazing. It's one season and one movie. Fantastic, fantastic show. Uh, and the other one by the same producer is Buffy the Vampire Slayer, which uh, I, I encourage you all to watch. It's, it's, it's seven seasons and then five seasons of Angel, and you should watch both of them in, in the, re the release order so you get the crossover stuff going right. Um, it's well worth watching. There's a lot of libertarian themes and uh, a lot of good stuff for... Um, for raising a child to become a libertarian warrior. Um, so I'd like to get more examples, because I'd like to make this into an hour-long talk to give it a different, different event. So if you have more examples, please email them to me, um, just at that, at that address. And, and I'm sure we'll have great discussion. I can't wait to hear the questions on this panel. So I'll stop now. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for everybody. Um, <clears throat> it's good, because there's not as much overlap as I thought there might be. But of course, Firefly is the, the one we definitely have to talk about. Uh, but I'll talk a little bit about it. But um, I like Ilya opening up with stereotypes, because there is another thing, too, that is true. Some of the geek stereotypes are true. And those are, of course, often true of libertarians, overwhelmingly male, sitting in your room, like fighting with people on the internet or playing on the internet. It's a very, very common sort of things. I, I do want to talk separately, though, about your nerds and geeks thing, because I have my whole hierarchy of that, too. It's very <laughs> important. Have you ever seen an old internet thing went around? It was the geek hierarchy. It was basically every, some, like, people, it was a flow chart that went down, it was, and every person going down considered themselves less geeky than the person above them. So Star Trek fans, and then the people who are geeky, it was like Star Trek fans that write fan fiction, and then Star Trek fans that write fan fiction that put themselves in the story, and then Star Trek fans that write fan fiction that's erotic and put themselves in the story, and then Star Trek fans that write fan fiction that's erotic and everyone's furries, you know, like it's, it's, uh, <laughs> So, it's a great thing. Um, so, and it is interesting, what Azalea said, that we have, we have entered a world where sci-fi has become mainstream. The geeks took over about, I'd say, when, when uh, Heath Ledger won an Oscar for portraying the Joker, I would say that was about the moment that it took over. Now, I want to talk about first one thing, the reason it's important for the progress that capitalism has brought to humanity and why science fiction is even possible or exists. If anyone's read Deidre McCloskey or just familiar with the basic idea that capitalism is the greatest enriching force in the history of mankind, the great enrichment, as she calls it, the, dove, the hockey stick graph of, of progress since about the Enlightenment. Now, what that actually implies, if you think about this in a different way, if you took a time-traveling machine and you went between, say, f took an average citizen who lived in 1400 BC, or perhaps in Babylon, or, and then brought them to, let's say, 1400 AD in like rural England, they would have very little to have to adjust to about differences in their way of life, which is an astounding thing if you actually think about it. One of the things that progress has done in terms of enriching ourselves is it made us actually start thinking about the future and thinking that it could be bigger and better, and that it should be bigger and better, and that if it's not, something is going wrong. That idea itself is crazy. Imagine asking someone in 1300, what do you think is going to be happening in 70 years? They'd be like, toil and <laughs> toil, yeah. So it's like this is why you said, on, on this day, you know, 13, 1300, it was toil. That was happening on that day. So even the invention of the concept of the future, this is why really sci-fi doesn't exist. You could get into discussions of, of prophecy and whether or not that has a sci-fi element or whether or not the religious, uh, religious discussions were looking at a different world and that looking at a better world in the future is sci-fi. But it's a very interesting genre that's unique to the progress that capitalism brings, and I think that's worth saying. The other reason I think that sci-fi is very re rele relevant to libertarianism 
is because a lot of times <clears throat> the biggest thing that we're actually fighting against is a lack of imagination. And this is very important. I give a lecture which some of you might have seen called the Statrix. And this is a reference, a term I've coined referring to, of course, the matrix. But the whole point of the lecture is to point out that the world around you is a false world that has been created by a governing structure. And things that you think are normal are not normal. And I'm here to give you a red pill. <laughs> you have to ask yourself, like, why? I mean, just for example, Pennsylvania, a state, United States, you need a flow chart to buy alcohol there. If anyone's ever been to Pennsylvania, you need a flow chart. Now, people do it. They say, oh, you, so you can buy cold six packs in some restaurants. But you can only buy beer by the case in these beer stores. And so if you want to get some cold six packs immediately, you go, but you go into the restaurant and you buy it there. You can only buy two. So you walk in, you buy two, and then you can walk out, and there's a little bin in front of these where you put them down in the bin, and you walk back, and you're like, whoa, I forgot my two beer. I'm going to buy two more, I guess. <laughs> and everyone participates in this mass delusion. <laughs> but more importantly, if we're talking about something less mundane, something like public education is a good example. How many of you ever had an argument or discussion with someone where you try to talk about the virtues of privatizing education and what they say is, oh, well, so what, everyone can go to those Catholic schools, those big, rich Catholic schools? And you have to say, are you really lacking in such imagination that you think that the world will look the same when you take away pu public schools now in my system? Why are there only private schools for rich people now? Because they're crowded out by the government. It would not look the same. So you need to start having some imagination. At the end of the day, that is one of the biggest things we're fighting against. As things disappear, people don't think that there's another possibility. So imagination is a huge part of, libertar of libertarian science fiction in general. And if anyone's ever read Moon is a Harsh Mistress, is a good example. Moon is a Harsh Mistress is an anarchist fable about a moon society that's completely anarchist. And there's a great scene in it where he comes down from the moon and there he's explaining to reporters how their privatized criminal justice system and family structure works. And they're blown away. He's blown away by the fact that they don't do this. He's like, well, you know, how do you make sure they have like nine wives, they all take care of each other, like they have this welfare thing that goes intergenerationally. They have all this criminal adjudication that works in broad clannish systems. They think he's nuts. He thinks they're nuts. And, but it takes the imagination of Robert Heinlein to even think about how you could do this. And that's one of the big keys for why I think libertarian sci-fi exists, because having the imagination to be like, well, what would happen if school system was abolished, and how would, it, how, would it, how would it change? What would people do? Or going further in the future than that? It's very important, I think, to, to science fiction in general. I also want to talk about a general theme that was actually part of my talk yesterday, which was the question of what kind of person do we want in society and how that relates to public health. But I think this is a huge part of a lot of libertarian things that have been mentioned today. One of the big themes that you see in libertarianism is what I call the, 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 the distinction between the frontier and the centralized area. And it's a, it's a very, very interesting thing because the, what was Firefly actually about? I remember when I first saw a commercial for it before it was actually airing, I was like, Space Western? <laughs> and I was just like, I don't think that's gonna be good. But what Joss Whedon was actually thinking was that what made the West in America and here interesting is frontiers are places where people move before governments. That's what they are. And you can either think about them as chaos or you can think about them as a place of authentic humanity. More authentic humanity. Now, authentic here is the watchword because the question of what people perceive as authentic is all of this. And it goes to the public health lecture because this question of whether or not smoking is an authentic thing or being, what way is, what sort of person should you be? When you think about the frontier, what is it like on the frontier in both the Hunger Games, we see it in the Hunger Games, it's basically a circle that moves in and as you move into the middle, it gets metal and glassy and fake. People are walking around in crazy wigs and crazy outfits, whereas Katniss is a woman of the earth, whereas the people in Firefly are people of the earth. And here you say they don't need the centralized government. In that dichotomy, the, I, you're supposed to look at it and think that Katniss is more real than the people in the center, or that Malcolm, Malcolm is more real and the people on the Serenity are more real than the people in the Capitol in a basic sense. This is a very important point. It helps us to try and that, that's something that we have to be able to grab onto and hope that people believe 
that those who are resisting outside of government or resisting it are doing something authentic and genuine as opposed to something fake. And those kind of things that you see in sci-fi are very helpful to us in general. You do see it in Star, Star Wars and Star Trek too. Now Star Trek is the interesting one, right? Yeah, communism in space, and it's, uh, but it's, it's <laughs> And, it, and, it, and it's interestingly, you know, Gene Roddenberry, when they were doing The Next Generation, had a rule for the first, until he died, I think, in the third season, or he had a rule that there could be no conflict between members of the crew. Because he thought in the future there would be no conflict between anyone. Or he, that was what he, well, he wanted his future to have no conflict between anyone as long as you solved the problem of production, which is the interesting element of Star Trek. The entire universe depends upon the replicator. That is the entire, they pretend that there aren't problems of scarcity and the replicator produces things out of thin air. And it, but now Star Wars is interesting on the other side because it's a little, it's more dirty. It has frontiers and how the frontiers are treated in Star Wars is where, for example, one of the new Star Wars novels, which is actually really good called Lost Stars. It's a young adult novel, it's very good though. <laughs> I mean, the, the frontier is like the, is the woman who ends up fighting, who wants to fight for the rebellion, they're, they're frontier people. And the frontier people are freedom-loving people. Now, in Star Trek, frontier is like where the prime directive ends, uh, which is a weird thing by itself, because uh, Ilya could go on about the prime directive way better than I can. But the prime directive is just a bizarre thing by itself. But you see this, and I would like to, you know, in you, Star Wars is interesting because the p politics of Star Wars are somewhat related to today. Because what, if you actually pick apart the Senate and the, and the Republic that exists in the prequels that we'd like to all forget, and you start picking it apart now, you realize that in the, in the opening crawl of Attack of the Clones, they talk about many thousands of star systems have, are leaving, and they're all represented in the Senate. So we have a Senate that represents thousands of star systems. This is a, a localized government this is not. Let's put it this way. <laughs> <clears throat> and you wonder what's happening in America right now, uh, and you say, well, there's all this gridlock, because it's very hard to get Kansans and, and, and people from Massachusetts to be governed under the same thing from Washington, and there's no reason it would. You think it's hard to get Kansans and Massachusetts in, Massachusetts in, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> what is Bay Staters. Bay Staters, okay, there we go. <laughs> um, to, to agree on something, try to get Twi'leks and Wookiees. It's very difficult. And there's no reason the Twi'leks and Wookiees should be governed under the same laws. And so what, of course, happens? Gridlock. Gridlock in the Galactic Senate, like you'd expect if you had thousands of senators representing different races. And what happens when you have gridlock? And an emperor rises, promising to cut through the gridlock, and, and Darth Trump emerges. <laughs> Here to say Washington's not listening to you. Well, of course they're not, because they got, you got one twilight voice and you're a thousand thing, it's never gonna work. That's again the centralization story, which is interesting, because again, there's a, there's a skepticism in, about centralization in Firefly, in Hunger Games, in Star Wars. There's a skepticism about whether or not centralized government works, which is interesting, because I think that skepticism is widely shared. If you just generally pull people, I think, in almost any Western country, like, is the government, like, good, like the, the centralized government, do you like, but probably now, now throw them all out. I mean, the government polls pretty low, but they still go back to the polls and vote for them, so that's kind of bizarre. Now, what are the implications for promoting liberty? Well, I mean, libertarian sci-fi, it's a very good mixture for the reasons I think I've stated, and they've been stated here too. It's hard to imagine libertarian romance novels. She reached for her milky, her milky white constitution, and <laughs> I mean, it's like, it, it's hard to imagine many things that fits as well. You could do libertarian thrillers, but there's something unique about science fiction that allows people to think about possible futures and human progress and what, how people should be and how they should live. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna exercise my right as chair and ask the very first question. Um, so what is the most libertarian D&D <coughs> Chaotic good. It's chaotic good. That's yeah. Chaotic good. I think chaotic good is probably correct, though you could make a case for neutral good, uh, because with chaotic good, it's not necessarily the case libertarians want chaos. They do want order. We just want a private order as opposed to a governmentally imposed one. So goodness that emphasizes maximizing chaos may not be the best fit for libertarianism. It may be that a well-designed balance between chaos and order done privately may be better, and that's neutral good. 
Hi. So firstly, I largely disagree the saying that mostly male, at least at the most popular level. And look at Harry, novel, uh, Harry Popper novels, they're read by women as much as they are by men. The um, Mockingjay stuff, the, uh, and the novels themselves, I think were predominantly, I would say predominantly female readership. So I disagree with, to, with the readership to, to that extent. And uh, if you have a look what's happening now, you see to be that um, the circle of justice warriors have got, got, got up there, and the women who, and this was stopping other type of um, libertarian or rather centre ideas coming through in, in, in the public area. So you've got this the thing of, of the Hugos or last year with the, with the sick puppies and things like that. You know what I'm talking about. If you don't, well, I'll sit down. Okay. So what, what, do, you, what do you think of that? I mean, um, did, 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 well, yeah, so did you yeah, see, see the, the, the really bad... Ill yeah, so I think there's only really two questions there, one about women in science fiction, the other about the Hugo Awards. On the first, it, I did not claim that women don't read science fiction. They clearly do. Many do. However, statistically speaking, the percentage of women who read science fiction is significantly lower than the percentage of men. Uh, in the survey that I mentioned earlier, if I remember correctly, it is something like uh, 30 to 35 percent of men say they read science fiction uh, at least once a year, whereas it's uh, only about half that percentage of women or even less, and uh, it may be the readership specifically for Suzanne Collins' Hunger Games novels is more evenly balanced, but I was talking about the readership for science fiction overall. On the controversy over the Hugo Awards and the fight between the sad puppies of, uh, or, and the, or the rabid puppies, there's two different groups actually, uh, on the one hand... Yeah, and, and the uh, sort of the social justice left on the other. Uh, for those of you who may not know, this is a controversy over the rules for giving the Hugo Award, which is the leading award, at least in the U.S., for science fiction literature. And uh, you're sort of two sides, both of which I at least find very unsympathetic. On the one hand, you have the sad puppies and the rabid puppies saying, well, this is sort of left-wing dominated, so we want to have a movement that uh, enables more right-of-center science fiction to win awards, which I think is in itself a perfectly good thing. But if you uh, look at this movement, many of these people turn out to be racist and uh, Donald Trump types, in fact. Uh, so they're not entirely sympathetic. And of course, on the other side, you have the politically correct left that's been fighting over these awards. And so there's been a tremendous amount of rhetoric online and elsewhere over this and competing slates for winning the awards and so forth. I think this is unfortunate. I think both sides have behaved badly in this competition uh, or in this battle, but I also think it doesn't matter as much as the contestants think it does because uh, in this day and age, people can access and learn about great science fiction even if it never wins a Hugo Award and even if it's never nominated for it, even if it's not on either the sad puppy slate or the rival left-wing slate opposed to them. So I think... Uh, for people who are interested in science fiction and also for people who are interested in libertarianism, I think it's more important to work on producing and disseminating science fiction that will actually be read and watched by people than in fighting these sorts of internal battles about the internal politics of science fiction. So I would urge those of you who are hardcore science fiction fans, it may be fun to follow this controversy, but it's better, uh, especially if you also want to promote liberty, to focus on things that are likely to be more effective and more important. Thanks. Uh, so I was a little surprised that nobody mentioned the most libertarian science fiction novel, which is Atlas Shrugged. And, uh, and on that point, though, so Roy Childs wrote an essay many years ago where he argued that the influence that Atlas Shrugged had as a science fiction novel was so overwhelming on the people, especially early on in the libertarian movement, and also in some sense pernicious because it was a kind of fantasy world that she was portraying. And this led libertarians into thinking that that was, in some sense, the right approach to thinking about their ideology is in a kind of fantastical way. Um, I'm not sure what to think about that criticism, but I'm curious how it might apply to this general approach to science fiction and libertarianism. Well, uh, I'm not a brand fan, but um, the, so I'm just gonna say, but I, I am gonna say just that uh, the, 
under under acknowledged thing about what she did. Everyone wonders why did she make, why did she the one who's such a gateway drug? Why did she make things so popular? Well, she wrote a novel, so that's important. I never forget this basic fact. Like she wrote a novel that's moderately interesting, and like, but it's it's better. It's not. It's better to be like here's a novel rather than here is. Me, you know, human action. Like so, so more libertarian novels like that. I'm for. Yeah. So um, the uh, objectivist alignment system was actually part of a larger talk on Ayn Rand in the context of science fiction. I just took that slide because I thought it was a good image. The um, I think so. I think Rand Rand wrote. I'm paraphrasing here that there's sort of four ways you can write fiction. One of them is writing new ideas in new forms, which she considered herself to be the only person capable of doing. Uh, <laughs> Then one was writing old ideas in old forms, which is most popular literature, according to Rand. The other one is writing new ideas in old forms, which is impossible, according to her. And the other is writing um, old ideas in new forms, which I think is where she would classify most of science fiction. So I think she was probably a bit harsh. I think a lot of people actually write new ideas in new forms. But most of them, I would say, are science fiction authors, that science fiction authors try to find new ideas and necessarily have to present them in new, exciting ways. So yes, Ayn Rand was a science fiction author in my mind, um, and I quite enjoyed her, her books. In fact, I would be willing to say that We the Living is one of the only examples of a libertarian romance novel that's worth reading. So just briefly on this, uh, our, I think certainly it could be described as science fiction, but the fact that it isn't is in part uh, an indication of the success of Ayn Rand that her novel was so successful that it's no longer thought of or never was thought of as being bound by a particular genre. I think clearly she had enormous success reaching people with her novels. I do think that uh, while you can have a success with a sort of very didactic approach that she had with characters making long 50-page speeches about the greatness of capitalism and entrepreneurship and so forth, I think most successful fiction, including most successful libertarian fiction, doesn't follow that model. They don't sort of beat you over the head with the ideology like Rand does. Rather, they tell a good story that's appealing and that can be appealing to people even if you don't like to read 50-page long ideological tracts and even if you don't already agree with all the ideas in a novel. So for instance, m the reason why The Guardian is worried about The Hunger Games is because it knows, or at least they think they know, that this is a story that might appeal to people who aren't already particularly libertarian, maybe even people who aren't particularly interested in politics. And so I think that sort of model is the one that I would urge people to strive for more than trying to become the new Ayn Rand who can package you know, 50 page long speeches into sort of a story form. She was immensely successful with it. I give her a lot of credit, but I'm not sure that it's a success that's easily replicable. Okay, so uh, I just haven't watched the, the most recent of the uh, the uh, uh, Catching Fire movies. Uh, uh, Mocking Jay Part Two. Mocking Jay Part uh, 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 the other night, and uh, actually, I was thinking that that the um, the um, the salute uh, could be a potentially useful symbol, except for that it looks a bit like a fascist salute. But the other one is is the um, the uh, Mocking Jay symbol. Uh, whether that could be sort of borrowed. Um, also, uh, v, for, v for Victory. Um, the Guy Fawkes masks, and, uh, and uh, anyway, that, that sort of meme. <laughs> not, not so much a question, it's just like, the sim maybe the, 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 just thinking about using, the, maybe we should be thinking about using the symbols from some of this popular fiction. All right, does anyone have something to say about that? No, no, no. Okay, I mean, yes, I agree with yes, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, I was actually going to ask about Atlas Shrugged, but that's all right. I have another question. Um, any thoughts on, say, Babylon 5? I'm a big Babylon 5 fan. I like it a lot. I think it, it is very good political science fiction, not necessarily libertarian, indeed in some cases somewhat unlibertarian. But I think it's a good example to learn from in that there is a f sort of complex fictional world there, but they develop it relatively slowly so as to enable people to have it accessible to them even if uh, they're not used to this kind of genre. Uh, and I think it also does a good job of combining interesting characters uh, with, uh, the, w with uh, building up a complex fictional world with a political message. I do think although the overall message isn't necessarily libertarian, there is one part 
that libertarians might want to focus on in rewatching this in that much of the evil that occurs in Babylon 5 is evil that arises from nationalism, from the conflict between the Narn and the Centauri. Good people on both sides of that conflict uh, end up doing horrible things, in part because they're nationalists. And of course, right now in the US, in Western Europe, uh, perhaps in other places, uh, nationalism is once again rivaling socialism or leftism as a great opposing force to not only libertarianism but even liberalism more generally. Uh, and so both in the area of fiction and literature but in the area of promoting libertarianism more generally we want to think about how do we face this particular adversary, uh, how can we show that this is not a direction uh, that people should want to go in. And Babylon 5 actually illustrates the dangers of it very well. I won't ruin the plot for you for those who haven't seen it, but uh, nationalism turns out not to be a wonderful force in the Babylon 5 universe. Um, sorry. Yes, thank you. Um, what do you think of the idea that um, a lot of the fandom of Harry Potter share that um, Voldemort actually isn't the greatest evil? Some say it's um, Umbridge, the malicious administrator, and others say it's actually Dumbledore for the greater good, not caring about the rights of individuals. So just to start off with, Voldemort is definitely evil, but I, I'm very sympathetic to the idea that he isn't the greatest evil. Um, his motives are fairly obvious and his methods are fairly predictable. There's nothing insidious about his influence. He says, I want to kill all the people who I don't agree with and you should let me do that. That's an obvious evil. That's not scary in the same way that, say, pulling the strings from behind, controlling people, manipulating themselves against themselves, which is a lot of what Umbridge does. Um, that she takes the best in people and turns it against themselves rather than just trying to get people who are also as hateful as you and gang up. So I think that there's a lot more interesting psychology in the other evils. Now, Dumbledore, I, I could get into, there's a lot of speculation about um, his past with Grindelwald and the greater good and all that jazz. They were both on the same side for a while. That's probably pretty niche, so I won't comment on it, but I think there's, it's, it's very interesting for people who want to learn more to look into that, that whole, whole subplot going on. I've never seen her. <laughs> so, uh, I, I, I've both read the books and seen all the movies. I think you can sort of argue about the ethics of what Dumbledore does. For example, he has been criticized in the grounds that particularly in the early books, he essentially lets these children take all the risks and puts them in dangerous situations uh, and then doesn't, do, doesn't use his vast power as a wizard to protect them as much as he could. At the same time, from a libertarian point of view or from a liberal point of view more generally, uh, he stands in contrast to something like the Ministry of Magic in that he's actually actually fairly careful about the means that he uses in the struggle against Voldemort. He tries very hard not to risk innocent people except for those three children. And he also <laughs> tries, uh, hard, he also opposes the ministry's violations of civil liberties uh, and does other things of this sort. And he emphasizes the importance of treating everybody with respect for their autonomy, regardless of their racial, ethnic, or in, in this case also whether even human or not. Uh, so I think. Uh, aside from some of the niche material that was pointed to before, I think Dumbledore, he's not a perfect libertarian hero by any means, but he does instantiate some of the principles that I think uh, we want to support as well. Um, I'd just like to ask a question in relation to science fiction and the idea of the, the space as being the, the, the frontier, or the final frontier to coin a phrase. <laughs> um, what's the role of the rugged individual and posse comitatus um, as as libertarian icons in those particular formats, and which do you see as, as gaining uh, greater currency uh, as time has gone by? Is it is it the rugged individualist, or is it posse comitatus to restore order? To I think that you have to start with the rugged individualist, and then you can get to posse comitatus. But like the the idea of you have to be able to think that these people like. The Firefly, for example, that these people are, are heroes when they're stealing from the government. I mean, that's like the, you know, and you have to get that idea that lawbreaking can be just because it comes from a sense of rugged individualism. And you get that too with Hunger Games and many other things when you start seeing the frontier, that they're not bad people. So you start with the rugged individualism, and I think you can get further with that, but that you have to believe that they're more authentic people than the ones in the capital. 
I actually may disagree slightly, and I think the rugged individual stereotype is one that libertarians should try to talk less about and to combat, because it's the one that the left and some of our, or maybe even some of our opponents on the right, also they want to saddle us with. They want to say, you guys are the ones that say, everybody has to be a rugged individual, has to be completely on their own, never depend on anybody else, and most people don't want to live like that. They want to be able to depend on other people, to cooperate with them, so the posse commentary Tatis is actually a better image. It's people cooperating together to provide security for themselves. And if you look, by the way, historically at frontier situations that worked well, they didn't work well because there were a bunch of rugged individuals each doing things on their own. Rather, it was people cooperating in adverse circumstances to do things together that they couldn't do alone. It's not a science fiction book, but I highly recommend Terry Anderson and Peter Hill's book, The Not So Wild West, which looks at social cooperation in the American West. There are similar studies about the early history of Australia and how people cooperate in the frontier here. When they were successful, it's not because they were rugged individuals, it's because they engaged in voluntary social cooperation. And that, I think, is a more appealing image for most people, not for everybody, but for most people, that's a more appealing image of freedom uh, than the image of the rugged individualist who doesn't depend on other people, doesn't care about them, is purely selfish and so forth. That's the image that our opponents want to saddle us with, and we should try not to fall for that. It's also, by the way, a false image about how social cooperation can actually work. If you try to be a rugged individualist all on your own, you will probably fail. It won't be very successful. Even Han Solo has two. Yeah, Han Solo had, uh, had lots of his friends, right, that he couldn't succeed without. Uh, Chewbacca is always with him. He caught Lando Calrissian and, and others. Um, so most of the examples you've presented so far have a corrupt government of some type and some plucky rebels and there's the rebellion against, you see all the flaws, there's a big fight, everyone's happy and then it fades to black. Are there any popular fiction or examples that you have that explore after the governments are overthrown and you're actually implementing libertarian ideals and that type of thing? Instead of just the fight against the corrupt, what's next? So, well, <laughs> it, so from a libertarian standpoint, so first of all, not libertarian, obviously, but Star Trek is all about how the government actually works. Uh, it's, you know, it makes everyone happy. But uh, the first thing that pops in, in my head is, um, is a book called Red Rising, which is a, a trio of books that recently came out that does deal with this to some degree. But I'm not going to go into it, but I am going to highly recommend those books to everyone. Uh, they'll be in a movie. They'll be movies soon enough. So it's a very good question. I think it's much harder to write good science fiction about building up a new state or society than uh, about overthrowing tyranny. But there are, I think, some examples. The one that comes to mind, and it's by no means unproblematic, both from a literary and ideological point of view, but David Weber's series of Honor Harrington novels Although a lot of it is sort of military science fiction, there's also an enormous amount of political detail about building what we would call rel at least relatively libertarian societies, both in the aftermath of the overthrow of an oppressive government, as with his case of the People's Republic of Haven, and also with other governments that are sort of more developed liberal democracies. But I agree, this is a tough uh, issue. Uh, I would also note that it is brought up uh, near the end of the Lord of the Rings. Obviously, the scouring of the Shire has some elements of this, the last part of Lord of the Rings. And also, at the end of the Hunger Games, uh, while she doesn't go into in great detail how the newer and better society would be built, she does emphasize that this is a difficult task, that they're, uh, what they have to do is not over with once President Snow is gone or President Coyne is gone, uh, that you have to develop a new mindset, new institutions, uh, and so forth. But I think for those of you who are aspiring science fiction authors, if you can write a good science fiction novel about this aspect of it, that would be really great, both from a uh, political point of view, but even just from the point of view of developing this literary genre. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah. so I think this actually points to one of the hardest things about pitching libertarianism, is that we're not trying to prescribe one particular system that we think is going to work best. It's hard to say what's going to come next, because the answer is, the market will decide. So, I mean, that, it, it's possible to write these sorts of things speculatively, but the answer is ultimately whatever works best for people who cooperate together and respect each other's rights. 
So that doesn't make a very good story, though. 